All right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I just scheduled this uh, working hour because I thought maybe we needed to just wrap up the work we had done as material sample and maybe we hadn't quite done that. Um, I put a link to a, a Google document in the chat. Um, but I just wanted to, A, thank everybody who participated over the, I don't know, 18 months or so that we worked on material sample um, and basically just ask your opinions about where, what you think the next steps are um, beyond what we managed to do. Quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, David. So for those of us who were initially tracking things at the very start of your work um, and have dropped off, I wonder, since there are a few participants here, uh, if you would like to do a summary of what was accomplished over the past 18 months. Uh, and then uh, maybe that might be uh, an opportunity to kind of dive into some of the things that you think might be uh, might need more attention. Well, so the summary is um, the link in this document that takes you to the um, the current milestone link. Um, those are essentially the changes that we proposed to Darwin Core that were uh, ultimately accepted. So um, that's kind of what we accomplished which was basically creating a new term, material entity, and then adjusting a lot of uh, Darwin core definitions to incorporate that term um, and sort of recognize that it it's in a way a superclass over the other material classes, which include sample, preserved specimen, living specimen, fossil specimen. So um, that's pretty much where we ended up. Um, as far as what I think comes next, um, I'm not really sure. I think whatever happens with the new model at GBIF might say more about what should happen. Um, but I still think we're um, stuck with the um, basis of record problem that Abby had and probably still has um, until such time as that model changes. And I also think it's a little bit weird that we have these terms that are considered subsumed within another term, but that's what was recommended, so. So I think if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, like there was kind of a desire to flesh out um, what were these subcategories of material entity and um, and what their properties are in some kind of like ontological framework. And I think that you know the problem is that figuring out how to do that on the time scale of the group was too much. And I, we just kind of pushed that off. So it, you know, I guess that would be probably the job of another task group, but it seems like that to me is where we left off. Yeah, I agree. And in the, the linked document that's here for the uh, summary, that is kind of what I say at the bottom in the next steps is that, you know, in a way we were looking at a term that would be in this case now material entity type um, that would tell you more about the material you have instead of having all these different classes that um, sort of sometimes make you uh, force you into making a false decision or a, you know, because you can't really pick between living or
preserved because you have both or something like that. So, Stan? Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to spill the beans here, but uh, <laughs> there is a proposal for a session uh, that has been submitted by James and David, I think. Is that correct for the upcoming um, Tadwig Spinach? 2024 meeting in Okinawa that is going to address um, the fact that the Darwin core occurrence concept is uh, an artificial superclass, so to speak, and um, kind of going to be asking people to, you know, give thoughts, I guess, and uh, opinion pieces about um how these things can be teased apart and perhaps more correctly structured or something um I, I i would i don't remember exactly what was said in the abstract but um i can imagine that i'm i'm for for my purposes i think um the summary that you've got is is you know in in the google doc is a good one um and i think a natural step is then to sort of cast out to the membership again you know what what thoughts are so what i think we've kind of got a forward track um you know sort of specified already um the only thing that i would say is i think we need to move this summary um perhaps edited or whatever any changes anybody wants to make but move it into a more permanent space not in not in google drive but in the github repository or some, somewhere at least so that there's a, a more permanent artifact um, the only other thing I want to say is that I think one of the difficulties we had was in, you know, subclassing material entity and subclassing hierarchies are notoriously difficult because um, they, people, you know, things get across purposes. They're very sort of functionally driven, I think. Um, but that may be, you know, also what next and what needs to be sorted out next and you know it's a combination of top down bottom up reconciliation and with that i'll shut up sounds good yuda it's ben actually the next on the oh okay <laughs> ben so i i just have a sort of a different question um so material sample, that term is used in the basic formal ontology, right? Why, what was the decision-making process behind using it, using that same term here? Like it maybe, maybe this is indirect and I've just wondered this for quite a while that because it is kind of a loaded, I mean, it's, they're similar, right? I mean, it is, it represents an entity, but the, the BFO is more thorough, that ontology. So why was, was there any, deliberation about whether that was the correct term for this particular concept you're trying to represent or there would be confusion with the basic formal ontology or was there anything any dialogue around that uh, i would say we had a lot. year and a half of dialogue around that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not I... semantically linked to anything else it's it is what the definition says it is no more no less and we, we talked about making other links, but they're not they're not there. What material ent that's a, a comment about material entity, Steve. Yes, I, I don't think material entity is formal formally linked to any other terms. It's we just wanted to get a clean definition for it, right? Am I remembering correctly? Well, and then, and it was, I would say, distinguished by from material sample in our discussions around the sample issue was about the sampling, you know, you know the sort of that brings a material thing into a human enterprise of, you know, sampling something for a purpose. But but it's not linked formally to BFO, I guess is what I'm saying. Material entity. No sample. Right. Material. The the term that we created has a definition that stands on its own. It is not linked semantically 
to something else. It's just what we defined it to be. And as far as I remember, the reason was to not import baggage from BFO. So just keep a, to have a completely neutral term and not load it with some background because there was another ontology. Oh, I don't know. Another one that we discussed and the, half of the people were going that way, the other one that way, and we decided to keep it neutral. Yeah, because one of the things that we looked at uh, in detail was eye samples and the kind of uh, vocabularies that they have set up, which are just another thing. Um, and I think we couldn't, it, it just became the point of, it's not our job to create or decide which of these ontologies is right for everyone. <laughs> We yeah. just want to have a term yeah. that everybody could comfortably use no matter what they have. Especially for assigning some sort of ID to the material, right? Because at the before all this happened, the only way you did that ostensibly was with material sample ID. And I, I think sample is just a loaded term. People felt um, strongly one way or another about it. And so we were looking for something more neutral. We definitely talked about like physical object or whatever. Um, yeah. And we just settled on material entity. You got it, it, it is kind of a, a, like a subclass of the BFO material entity. It, it, there, there's, it's more, it's narrower, but it is, they are, you know, if that was pretty cool, I think, but. Um, yeah, I mean, and distinct from informational entity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yuda. So you were asking about the way forward. And uh, for me, so when, when I came back to the community, I started out with GL cycle naively and then moved to, into Latimer core and thought that it was all quite normal that uh, there was structure to uh, all these terms. Um, as I would expect intuitively, there were classes and properties and things made sense. And then I came to the material samples and suddenly I had to recognize that that is not the normal in biodiversity standards um, and that Darwin core is a bag of terms and um, we also had quite a lot of discussions about that, about should Darwin Core have a structure or not. Um, and so like for me, material sample is and was a lot about vocabularies that I see as a, as a step forward. Um, because it's one one thing about talking about these high level terms, but they don't really make sense without filling them with vocabularies and giving them a scope. Um, because otherwise it gets too vague. However, when you start into vocabularies, um, it's one of these huge topics. Um, and you also start, these vocabularies, they're hierarchical. Um, or too many of them. And so you get into structure. And um, yeah, so, so for me, currently a lot is about linked data and about structure and thinking about all this, all the concepts that I don't know about ontologies and what the difference is to what we do. And maybe we should really get going in that direction. So from, from Recode, we just deal with that every single day. Um, we have to kind of make do. And I would love to, to have the tool get, just import the tools from Tadwig. Um, and, but currently we are just trying to find our own way kind of, which I don't find um, perfect. 
Um, so it's, yeah. So I think it's, uh, for me, the way forward for material example is about structure, about finding a formal way for vocabularies to fill our terms with, um, with scope and with like meat and also make them useful because the terms themselves are only so far useful. It needs the vocabularies to really be able to to share data and merge data sets. So, yep. Talk to yeah, I'll, I'll say from my perspective, because, uh, you know, this is probably what I spend a good 60% of my time on at Arctos is discussing essentially controlled vocabularies. Um, and so, yes, we're doing the same thing. We're in our little corner making our um, controlled vocabulary for whatever um, that may not mesh very well with yours, Yuda, um, because we've made different decisions in our little black boxes. Um, and, you know, I do see that as something that should be more of a community wide effort somehow. I don't know if. Tadwig is the way that should happen, but would definitely make everybody's life easier if we were all working on it together instead of everybody in their corners doing whatever um, and then trying to mash those things, you know, all together. So I hear you on that. Steve? You're muted, man. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify one thing about like Tadwig vocabulary. So I put a link to the vocabulary maintenance specification. And this is like really where the, you know, the, the official rules come in. So we, we talk about like, Tadwick vocabularies at their base as being like a bag of terms. It doesn't mean they can never be more than a bag of terms. But what it means is that if you want to have structure, you build it on top of the bag of terms. And so there is a, a mechanism for, um, for like adding an ontological layer on top of Darwin Core. Nobody has done that yet but it's it, it, it could be done. And if you combine this together with the vocabulary maintenance specification, which is sort of like the, the partner document to the standards documentation specification, it talks about a process involving um, uh, establishing the, uh, what you're trying to achieve by enhancing a vocabulary and then um, demonstrating that what you have suggested um, actually achieves those goals. So it's, uh, I forget what the names of the documents are, but you, you have a um, feature report and implementation experience report. So the idea is you don't just get a bunch of people together in a room and they say like, hey, let's write an ontology for Darwin Court. You get a bunch of people in the room and you say, what are the problems that we want to solve? And if we're going to solve them by building an ontology, what do the features need to be in this ontology to solve them? And then you build the ontology and then you show that it that it achieves the things that you want to achieve. And then that can be added as a layer on top of the bag of terms. There could be two layers built on top of the same bag of terms if people don't see the universe in the same way. The problem that we had before was that we had some very vocal people who said this is what the biodiversity universe is like in my brain and so we're all gonna we're gonna make darwin core fit what's in my brain and people didn't agree on that and and we didn't know you know well why do you look at the world that way well it's because i want to accomplish a certain thing well that thing you want to accomplish is not the same as the thing that somebody else wants to accomplish so that's that's sort of how the whole bag of terms thing came about is to say like it's 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 too much to say we're going to build 
the whole thing and get everybody to agree. We, we all agree on the basic bag of terms level. And if you want to have something more complicated than that, you can build it on top of that. But you have to explain what you're going to achieve by doing that and show that what you built achieves that. Just saying like, this is how I see things in my head is not good enough. You and a community of people have to show that that thing you have in the head in your head actually does something useful. Stan? Um, I think um, I've, I've got some sympathy for, for Yuta's suggestion though that um, the, the new GBIF data model might uh, guide us into adding some structure to Darwin Core or that we you know can be plugging Darwin Core terms in you know hanging them on that structure see what happens um so uh, you know i i come from <laughs> you know my experience in this domain is 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 long and comes from you know at the beginning i was at the smithsonian and dealing with people who were trying to put all of the information that the smithsonian was dealing with you know across art history technology natural history etc um, and they were building this thing they called the data dictionary. And it was very much like what we did eventually with the Darwin Core. And I came to that and looked at it as though like, ah, this makes no sense. I was coming at information modeling from a relational database perspective and structure was really something that was required to get precise semantics on things. And so I was very much against the data dictionary uh, approach to things um going for entity relationship models or object models and um and then you know we again because of this the the scope of what we were trying to tackle in darwin core and and the the problems we were having with technology at the time i think you know persuaded us that it, at least some basic definitions would help and so we ended up sort of reverting back to that kind of structureless form but now i think we might be in a position to to move forward with things in in a slightly more structured at least to to test it out and build perhaps application schemas that are useful to particular communities and to get those to be harmonized in some way so i think that's where gbif is going with its grand data model but um, i might be speaking out of turn yuda yeah. Well, yeah, we're just jumping in the deep end again. It's kind of like this group, I think. Um, I have been wondering about meaning. And so maybe it's too optimistic to build a structure. I, I know I want to build a structure for conservation, um, for the Kunming biodiversity framework for monitoring. Um, but that is usually, I mean, that's completely wide. Um, that includes, yeah, it goes from culture, social things to molecular, the molecular level and to find, yeah, I'm wondering if we can find one single structure, one ontology that would cover the breadth of global monitoring. So Steve, I hear what you say and yeah, Maybe also Stan, what what you are saying, is it is it even possible to do something like that? And apart from that, we are all volunteering. I'm completely at the top of like what I can do. We had earlier the meeting for agents, and I'm quite, was just really quiet because I just don't have time. I I see it <laughs> as really agent. I see completely as um, crucial as one of the important facts, but I I just can't. And this is something similar. I mean, this is even bigger. It's, it's just huge. Mm -hmm. So um, going forward, if we, if we want to go in this direction, it, um, we would need to think how we can make it possible, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, 
the next step that I see really requires more than a bunch of volunteers meeting once a month, um, which it's very hard to get things done that way, um, especially if it's very detailed and requires some deep thinking because quite often people show up for the meetings and participate, but when the meeting's over, there's no thought given to the topic until the next meeting. Um, because time, I mean, like Yuta says, people don't have time to just sit and think and work on these things, which I think need a lot of that. So, James? Yeah, well, I guess I would just say that I think much of the work we do is background. It is volunteer. It does take this kind of broad thinking, right? But where the rubber always hits the road is projects. Projects and or GBIF, when you have something that's got funding that has to do something, I need to implement X, so I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll agree with those nice big people, and sometimes I won't, and whatever. It's my space. I'll do what I want. Um, you know, and projects will be like that, too. But in a lot of ways, you know, I can speak to, just like you're speaking to Arctos, Dave and I can say the same for Dina. You know, we implemented a sample-based, completely sample-based uh, model. And so, you know, we believed in the future of this, and we still do. And so, you know, in our little corner over here, we're working on that and, and thinking about it. But I really think it, we need the community. So this leads to the why are David and I proposing to do this kind of session, which most of you will be pinned in <laughs> to participate in. Uh, why are we doing this? Because we feel like, well, some of the people that this is most important to, and the reason we're having this hybrid meeting, because we'll have our, all of our users there. We'll have this community that's not very, you know, sample savvy. You know, I've done a couple of sessions just saying, well, what about the little guys? You know, what about all this stuff that we're kind of been ignoring but can't ignore anymore from microbiomes to, you know, geology, all kinds of other things. Well, you know, that rubber's hitting the road. Uh, and so these people need to be our advocates. We need to tell them why is it important to be sample thinking and, and a little broader than their specimen thinking. Uh, so, you know, I'm all over the place here, but what I'm saying is that usually the way the work gets done is project. Somebody has to, like, implement something. Christian? Yeah, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, we've been um, we've been dealing with uh, some severe um, IT problems here in Berlin, and um, we continue to operate under uh, a number of limitations. Um, but um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to join this call to tonight. I should say, um, and um, so. Um, yeah, what are the most important points uh, or lessons for me from the work um, of this task group? So, um, first of all, um, um, I personally learned a lot about Darwin Core um, and the motivation behind certain structures and terms that um, were important to understand in order to um, deal with the goals of the task group. And um, so that for me has um, been uh, quite a journey and I'm very grateful for being able in this way to learn more about Darwin Core and, and, the, and the use cases that drive it. And um, the, um, the um, one, one of the most important outcomes I think uh, from this task group is that um, that we were able to um, broaden the um, or get yeah, to to broaden the discussion that started um, being a discussion about um, samples, and uh, we ended up introducing a term that is a mod, a lot more generic than that. And um, I'm personally I'm very happy that um, we came to the conclusion that this would be a valuable addition to Darwin Core, because I think. Um, this is one of those cases where, um, where, where a new generic term will help 
to provide the structure to integrate data from different use cases, data from different sources. And um, um, you see, um, from my in my experience, um, mod modeling the world um, or certain aspects of the world um, and making sure that you will be able to say what you want to say um, afterwards using that model. It's, it's sort of a two-headed beast. On the one hand, um, you have specific use cases and specific requirements um, for what you want to be able to encode and to share with others. Um, um, so that is certainly true. But then on the other hand, um, you often find that um, on, on a more general level, you there are distinctions which are so universal, so pervasive across different use cases and even different domains of inquiry that um, it's, it's a good idea to have a look at those and to understand if those general distinctions that others have already thought about long and hard um, are applicable to your use cases, to your uh, um, to, to your specific application goals as well, and I think that is that is what we succeeded in doing by introducing material entity to Darwin Core, uh, because it is a bridge to other ontologies, namely the open biological and biomedical ontologies community, um, which is a is an active a community from different domains of inquiry in biology and the biomedical sciences. And um, I think it's very important that that connection is nurtured in the future because there are um, ontologies and terms and uh, constructs and design patterns, um, which in my opinion are mature and have um, uh, have been tried and tested against a number of different um, application backgrounds. And um, I feel fairly confident that some of those design patterns using certain elements from these ontologies are also important complements to the biodiversity and collection um, application background. So I think this is, um, in my opinion, um, a very good and valuable result to have that one bridge, hopefully, uh, of, with uh, many others following um, by introducing material sample, uh, sorry, material entity to uh, Darwin Core. And then I also wanted to say, um, in response to what um, Steve um, has said before, um, this, uh, it became also very obvious to me during the work in this task group um, that while formally it's a list of terms where each comes with a definition, um, these terms do not operate um, independently from each other. And I mean, how could they? Um, of course, there is already a model, uh, uh, an additional structure connecting these terms in the practical use of the Darwin core standard and of the serialization, serialization formats that are being used to transfer information using Darwin core from one place to another. Um, it's just that, um, as it turns out, at least this is my understanding, that these different models that are in the heads of standard operating procedures of different institutions, they are not um, formally or properly documented often. Um, there, there, time and again, there seems to be misunderstandings. And this is only natural because um, there, there is no official structure on top of the bag of term layer. Um, but nonetheless, um, this, this structure or these structures are already there and they're in use. And, and most of the time for the things that are really important and where misunderstandings become 
uh, very obvious early on. Um, I think um, there already there already already has happened a a negotiation process in the past between the stakeholders that are concerned, and that informal structure on top of the terminological level um, has already also matured. But this task group, I think, is one example where um, users have hit upon um, um, one of those barriers that come from different ideas that people have about the use of these terms. And um, the way I see it, there is no way around continuing this the, this work, maybe in other task groups, um, by uh, tackling other edge cases, other myth misunderstandings um, between informal models of, of how Darwin core terms um, are supposed to work together. Um, and most certainly this will be driven by, um, by specific use cases because there's, um, yeah, it will be hard to find uh, people who um, could do this as as a main project um, in their in their work time. So um, I'm really looking forward to the um, the next uh, type of uh, fringe cases or contradictions or misunderstandings that pop up and that will perhaps prompt um, another task group. Um, and uh, as James has already said, in, in Dina we're focused on on samples and. Uh, how they uh, transmute into each other through different uh, actions uh, in, in managing collection items and so on. And um, so I would be, uh, um, I, I'm certain that we from our side also will stumble upon um, um, certain cases um, where we find that the uh, options to represent that in Darwin Core as an important standard uh, for transferring data from A to B are insufficient. And um, so um, um, I suppose that um, also from, from, from the work in DINA alone, um, we will continue to bring certain uh, questions into Darwin Core um, because, of course, we we will continue to use Darwin Core as an important exchange format. Yuda. So, um, in a way, I can. Um, trying to find a beginning. Um, so I can, I, so both uh, James and, and Christian, you, you said it, it's, a, it's kind of like a mixed bag. So you're on one hand, you're saying it's project based and it needs use cases, but then Christian, you also pointed out, well, we want to share data and kind of like, um, yeah, with everybody. And it should be like um, very high level, very general. Um, and and I also agree that we have this kind of like this vague structure um, already in Darwin Core, um, but it is none of that is formalized, and it's. It's prone to, you were talking a lot about misunderstandings, Christian. Um, and I would, yeah, I'm just questioning, I'm questioning it, in as far we can get to a real uh, general layer that is solid um, and has been fully developed. Um, I see um, it is good to have use cases and to always check. I mean, that is what GBIF is doing. Um, GBIF is basically for the new model is it's a completely abstract and theoretical process as I have, as I know it. 
um, but they have the they check with the different use cases, which I find find sensible. Um, however, if you're going, if you're going not, if you're going project based based with like you have like a, a use case apart from building standards or an ontology, I'm I'm not sure if there are the sufficient resources to to build this structure. Um, so I find it really difficult. I, I find I personally think we uh, we need to have a, de a dedicated theoretical project, call it maybe like that, for building um, these layers of structure on top of Davincore and making sure they integrate or not, decide on what we want, if you want to integrate with the existing ontologies and, and standards. Um, yeah, for me, it's just too much uh, hand waving in a lot of um, ways. Steen, uh, Stan, sorry. Um, so one of the other, so, we, so we've mentioned the fact that uh, use cases and uh, context for building these ontologies and models is, is driven by functional requirements to some degree. Um, at an even almost higher level of functional requirement, there's a distinction, I think, between what the BFO does and, and what that biomedical ontologies community does and what we've been doing in biodiversity informatics. And in the BFO world, I think they do a lot of reasoning across really, really diverse conceptual structures, processes, um, you know, from development and genetics to morphology. And, you know, you, you take a look at uh, things like the Phenoscape project or the, uh, the plant ontology or the basic anatomy ontology. You know, you, you're, you're going across all of these really broad different domains, in a sense, or disciplines of biology even or beyond. But in the biodiversity world, we've been working on integrating data that is perhaps not quite so, well, definitely not so functionally diverse or conceptually diverse, but we have still masses of quantities of data. And what we've been doing is enabling all that stuff to come together um, in a sort of pre-digested, pre-integrated, you know, not schema late, but schema first kind of a way, at least a simple schema. And um, so, you know, they they have their different roles, and I and I I agree with Christian. I do think it's worthwhile to um, have us connected to the BFO world, um, but I think um, we can also build very useful things um, with our you know more restricted purposes of assembling these massive quantities of data that we've got um, primarily from the specimens and observation world. Um, the things that I think we are going to need to work on in, in particular is sorting out some of that stuff, enabling some more of the observation kind of stuff like the organism tracking, camera traps, um, protocols for monitoring, sampling, um, building that in and the uses that get attached to those, uh, you know, why those um, sort of like collecting event data are critical uh, for measuring abundance and things like that. So the, those sort of are being bolted on to our sort of basic um, biodiversity informatics world. And um, but again, I uh, also want to touch base back to um, this notion of getting our description, our, our, you know, the document that we've got, our summary into a, a more permanent basis. And so 
um, I want to sort of put a pin in it that we have at least a kind of a nominal plan for what's going to happen there. Um, and as we, as we come away from this discussion. Yeah, which, I mean, one of the things I asked about, um, you know, once all of our suggestions were implemented in Darwin Core is, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? How do you wrap up a task group? And I feel like there's still not really a good answer for that. Um, because I don't want this thing to just be dangling around forever and people to think we're still doing something when we're not. So um, I would like to somehow have this, here's a summary of what we did. Um, and these are some of the things we see that somebody might want to work on next, but our task group is done and, you know, somebody else can pick up the ball from here. So I still don't really know that I know the best way to do that. Steve? Um, I mean, I think you could publish a report. <laughs> the like, I think the closest analog to this was the, um, what was it called? Vocabulary Maintenance Task Group um, that uh, Doug Anderson and Eoman Otawman and I were on. And in the end, we we published a report. It, it, it didn't have a deliverable deliverable that was a vocabulary or a standard or anything it was it was basically a report mm -hmm. and so I mean in this case we do have one deliverable which is that we made these created this new term and we made these changes to other terms but I mean I would say take whatever notes we have put it in a report and figure out some place to put it on the Tadwig website I mean, one of the issues that, it, that, that as the Stan knows, I've <laughs> talked about this for some time, is getting the community page to make it clear what groups are still operating. And I think part of that involves creating a history page where things that are done move to the history page and the community page only includes groups that are actively working, but that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. yeah. That's part of our... Um... As we were trying to map out the beginning and the operational parts of it, we didn't go through the whole life cycle. <laughs> and and what we've certainly found out, you know, it's like in the life cycle, I'm talking about what, you know, all the different ways that task groups can finish mm -hmm. or the ways that interest groups and task groups evolve. Um, so we are still working that out. And um, yeah, we, we are definitely going to have to try to map out what um, Steve was just talking about of groups that are closed, et cetera. Um, for this specific case, I think we're either going to, um, you know, in essence, freeze the, the repository that we did or, um, and, and then the question is where, where does all of, where do these artifacts, the most, most long lived, you know, essential distillation of our discussions, where does that go? And and can, you know, we need to um, make sure that that's referenced from particular places. And since all of this was going to changes in, in the Darwin core, um, it seems like we're gonna have, we need to have some, some uh, signposts in the Darwin core repository or website, you know, along with that standard to point to this work. I just put the link to the report that I was referring to in the chat. James? All I was going to say is that, uh, you know, we were talking, well, we created a journal uh, somewhat on purpose. And uh, one, I, I know we had discussions about the journal sort of an end state, a reporting place, a you know, for interest groups and task groups. So just, just to keep that in mind as, you know, slightly more credit than just dumping stuff in a GitHub repository and walking away, uh, you know, sort of idea. But uh, there are obviously other places we could go for more exposure depending on the audience. You know, there's a trouble. We could write to different audiences as well. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, just just a reminder about that. Yeah, I, I would say the the views control vocabulary task group published a paper in BIS. That was our last thing that we did. So that certainly could be done. Yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that's like, uh, what we did is already published. It's part of Darwin Core now. Um, and so I don't feel the need to write a paper or tell everybody about it because it's there. Um, but I would like for people to understand that the task group met, we did some stuff and now we're done. Um, so if you're still interested in this, either take over the task group or create a new task group or something like that, right? So I think that's the main thing that um, I want to see communicated. That's the circular irony of all research is that why it's so hard to write stuff up because you've already had the fun part. You've done all the work. Who the hell wants to write it up? <laughs> I, I mean, like I feel like in this case, the, the work kind of speaks for itself. It's there. It's a public resource. It's not some hidden thing, you know? Um, it, yeah. Anybody who's using Darwin Core, if they go look up the terms, they see it. So it, I don't think there's a need for us to like broadcast that this happened. I don't know. Sam said something intriguing to me, though. As, as I look back in our discourses, et cetera, at, you know, these amazing uh, sort of discussions <laughs> with our usual characters that are massive. I mean, you know, A, we don't kind of want to repeat that. <laughs> and, and B, is just such a amazing sort of casual knowledge store of all kinds of great ideas and pushing and shoving. And, and I don't know, Stan, we don't have a plan for like that, do we? Like, where would that kind of stuff go? Yeah, it's not really consum easily consumable, though. Oh. So I think I think the the, the hard work part, uh, as always, would be the distillation of those discussions into something that is more pithy, you know, that and 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 organized. Um, the future historians, man, just think about the, the wealth of great stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if somebody wants to listen to the hours upon hours of our meeting recordings, good for them. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I, I would like to accomplish is to feel like this is kind of wrapped up and that I'm not obligated to do any more things related to it. Christian? Um, yeah, I, I think I basically agree with you, Teresa. Um, so for me personally, I think um, the most valuable resource, um, the most valuable documentation in connection with the task group um, is in, are, are the um, are the written discussions laid down in the um, in the um, repository of the task group, um, and. I feel that if uh, if if I wanted to um, go back and and examine some of the arguments um, that led to um, that led that led to our uh, per, that led to the term requests and to 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 those changes um, um, that the uh, that the task group um, made to Darwin Core, then I would go back to these written accounts. And and follow through the arguments and and uh, see where interesting ideas, thoughts, controversial thoughts were, and um, to pick up on those. Um, and um, I think I would only be motivated to participate um, in 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 a paper if that is a real paper. So something that something that is uh, is is peer reviewed and and published uh maybe as part of it as a of a Tedwick conference or so um uh that that would that would certainly um 
motivate me to uh, participate in, in writing up an extra paper with the main conclusions of the task group uh, uh, and and uh, writing down perhaps in more detail than in the changed in new terms that were added to Darwin Core, um, what the task group has done and why uh, it has made the choices that it has made. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, second the notion of of putting some of this out in a in a BIS paper, um, just because um, I think we're going to have um, you know space, so to speak, um, and it's and it's a it's a good place for it to to go. Um, I don't know how much time I would be able to to commit to that, but um, I would I would definitely commit some and the other thing I want to say is that um, I'm I'm planning to or at least I think I am um, to submit a paper you know uh, for the Okinawa conference to James's um, symposium on you know teasing apart and making sense out of occurrences um, you know what, whatever the whatever the title was, but I, I and and I'm I'm I want to bring the use case stuff that I contributed to this discussion to that discussion. So it's it's going to be about all the different use cases that we're aware of in biodiversity that um, sort of identify the different things that we're um, that we have to deal with. Well, one of the things that I um, I just made a note for myself to do is that we do have um, quite a bit of meeting notes and things in uh, Google Drive, and I think I will transfer those over into the repo, the GitHub repo, um, so that they're in a more permanent spot and easy to find along with all of our discussions and the issues. Um, if if as they're for Google... If they're Google Docs, you can pretty easily export them as PDFs, and then when they go get pushed to GitHub, GitHub will render the PDFs so that people can look at them, and they're frozen. Fair. Um, but as for uh, writing a paper, I have zero time for that. So um, <laughs> if somebody else wants to... <laughs> head that one off and and do that that would be you know fine by me I would probably help if I could but I just don't have the wherewithal at this time to head up writing a paper Yuda and that is where I'm getting concerned because we have the we are my impression is we are building these amazing foundations, but we never we always stop halfway through when it starts to become really difficult and you really need to kind of distill what you really think and um and you you need to you need this push towards a, a robust structure and not this yeah, we I feel we very often we we stop kind of like at at an intermediate level and we don't we don't pull through Stan uh, this might be a somewhat ridiculous suggestion uh, but I'm, I'm interested to see what you think does anybody have any experience with um, putting an AI filter whatever onto a discussion or some longer text to abstract the content, um, you know, because we could take potentially some of our long discussions and 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 see what an artificial intelligence extracts from it. <laughs> so I have. <laughs> I was going to expect well, it would be. You. I mean, it's like you know. I mean, I. So it takes me a little while to write. Writing's like sort of sort of one of those sort of weak spots. And and it's like all right, there, there's there's chat TVT. Come on, there's got to be a way just to. It's my writing. I just to summarize it. I need to bring it down for like four paragraphs to one. Right. This is this is a common exercise for me. It, it does pretty good. 
So believe it or not, you have to go back and it, edit it, but it really does, uh, you know. I've, I've <laughs> seen well, that, It reads well, I've but if you that. think about it, it just is a... Well, you gotta, you gotta go yeah. back and read it, but it... How much, it definitely... how much hallucination emerges? <laughs> <laughs> you well, can do it if online. You provide, <laughs> if you provide the text and ask it to summarize it, it does not really do much in the way of hallucination. I've seen somebody submit their you know, like a series of lecture notes and ask ChatGPT chat GPT to make a study guide for it. And it's amazing. So I think the, the hallucinating happens a lot if you just like ask a random question about what's on the internet. But if you actually say, take this information and summarize it, it's, it's actually quite good at that. Um, I, 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 I need to get some, some experience in, in playing around with that. I might, I might try that. I'll let you know if I have any success. I'll tell you something. It's like chat GPT online. You make an account and you just copy and paste a little chat window and you tell it what to do, like summarize with active voice, past tense, then paste it. <laughs> it, just, it just does it. It's crazy. Like it's, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So I would, I, mean, I would definitely be interested in 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 the results. So that uh, yeah, <laughs> that in all fairness, uh, that might be an option to get a get a quick um, quick a quick summary uh, from the from the uh, <laughs> documentation that we have uh, piled up. Uh, just move. I the can ball give faster. a talk about that. Come on, you know. <laughs> Part of the problem is it's not all in one place. Um, so. No, well, we we have we have at least we have, what we have is very discursive. You know, start from a um, a subject and then it sort of goes all over the place, and um, it'll be interesting to see what happens and and how distinct they remain and cross over. Maybe combine them. We'll see what happens. Iterative summarization. <laughs> Anyway, we'll put a pin in that, but I think the summary that you've got, Teresa, is very valuable. So I think that's something. And and um, there is also um, a plug-in to go from Google Docs to Markdown. Um, it's not very sophisticated, but if the document is not too you know, highly structured, it, it can do okay. So we could take that... Um, the summary that you've got and keep it a little bit dynamic by moving it into Markdown. If yeah, you, if I mean, that's to. essentially what I was thinking of doing, so. Um, Is that Pandoc that you're talking no, about, Stan? Because I've, well, I've used Pandoc to do that. I've used that too, but there is a plugin for Chrome that um, that does, you know, this translation of Google Doc to, to Markdown, although it, it um i don't think it's specific to github markdown so like i said if it's not too terribly structured it, it comes through okay yeah which i mean our meeting notes really aren't it's like yeah. headers do, you, and... do you want me to give it a try uh if you want to you can all right um i will do that after this and toss that into our repository somewhere summary yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> sounds good to me. Um, okay, so I guess, you know, from this point, I would like to know if anybody feels like we should add something in that summary document about what we think next steps are. Um, you know, for me, one of the things is this whole let's not have more than one class of material and can we get rid of these other terms and instead have something that's you know material type or whatever um, to kind of perform that same function um, but I, I don't know what other things that you guys see that maybe would be good for another task group or a continuation of this task group to work on
I would leave, I mean, you, we can identify some some problem areas or some potential avenues forward, but I would kind of leave that up to the organic nature of interest or task group formation and through TADWIG processes, see what, see what um, you know, especially what comes out of Okinawa. Fair. Anyway, I want I want to you know applaud your work, Teresa, for for this. I know that was that was quite a long slog. Um, that sh you showed some real discipline in, in keeping us at least on a on a drum beat, and uh, you know it was it was a lot of cat herding. <laughs> so, nice talk that we appreciate your efforts. <laughs> yeah, cat herding is a uh, my standard job title, so. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, but yeah, I, I I will say that this whole experience um, has made me think that sometimes something like this, it would be a lot nicer to have everybody meet up and spend three days and just get it done um, than drag it out over 18 months and, you know, X number of meetings. Um and I don't know if that's possible because as Yuta points out, we are always lacking resources and everybody's volunteering and trying to get people in one place at one time is hard, uh, which has also always been my argument for all these conferences that we have. Why are we giving papers and talks? We should be sitting down and getting some stuff done um, instead, which is what I would kind of prefer to see happen. But that's just my uh, opinion and I could be wrong. Well, um, um, just uh, on that topic, um, it's one of my tasks to get done this week is to put out the call for use of the community support fund again. Um, we have been quiet in that because of the pandemic. You know, it it, it sort of faded. Um, I think the last call we made was 2017, quite before pandemic. But um, um, the the executive has approved it. Um, it's still a modest amount of money. It, it costs a lot of money to get people together to work on it. Um, the, the biggest users of that fund so far have been the Biodiversity Data Quality Group, which have gotten together several times to work in person over, a, you know, let's say it's like four people getting together in a room for, for three or four days. Um, but that's involved getting people from South America to Australia and things like that. So I think they want to meet in Hawaii. <laughs> this next... Well, why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, there will be an announcement and um, it will go out to the conveners of interest and task groups, et cetera. And, um, you know, the call will be open. It seems like if you planned an event like that around a conference, like before or after, such that you had a significant number of participants whose airfare was already being covered by the conference, then if you just had the additional cost of like getting a room for a day or maybe one participant who doesn't have money or something could get funded, it, it seems like that might be a way to piggyback on top of what other people are already paying for. Piggybacking is definitely one of the things that um, elevates your proposal higher in the list. <laughs> anyway. Makes sense. I mean, the other obstacle can be uh, people can't leave work for two weeks at a stretch. Okay. Um, so tacking on to a conference, those extra days can also be problematic. So um, this is why I'm like, why, why don't we just do this at the conference? Like this could be the conference. Um, just thoughts for the future. Yeah, well, this, I mean, just to kind of like put the clock back, I was one of the complainers at, you know, like Biodiversity Next in Leiden that John Wajorek and I had to sit out in the lobby with the baby on his knee to get Darwin Core work done. And why did we not have sessions during the conference? And that's kind of how these working group sessions got started as a way. 
I mean, we also like went virtual. So I guess this was kind of the virtual response to that. But but what we're actually doing right now was sort of an outgrowth of complaining that people did about work not getting done at conferences. But it's also hard, you know, people plan things at conferences and then there's a field trip and <laughs> people want to go on the field trip. They don't want to stay and have a meeting. So, you know, there's that too. And <clears throat> the desire to be in all the sessions all at once, all the same. Maybe. Yep. All problems I've encountered. All right. Well, um, I guess, do any of you have anything else that you think we need to talk about or add to our documentation um, before we wind up signing off here? Well, I, th I certainly um, also wanted to thank You just froze. Oh, no. <laughs> right in the middle of your thank you. More IT problems. Um, Teresa, you're going to be, be snagging the chat? Um, yes, I will definitely do that. Um, and I'll just add it to this little agenda. Um, and yeah, I, I will uh, look at getting all of our stuff out of the Google Drive so that it's in GitHub so that there's one place to look for stuff. Um, and if anybody has anything else to contribute um, for the task group, it's probably best to put it over in the GitHub so that it's all together with everything else. Um, but again, I just really appreciate all the time everybody spent thinking about this and working on this and uh, trying to help make Darwin Core a little more usable for people who have things that aren't um, what material sample was expected to be. Chris Jones back. Yay. You're twice. Yeah. Um, I was cut off just when I wanted to start uh, my praise, Teresa. <laughs> um, so I'll make it quick. Uh, Teresa, thank you very much for uh, leading this task group. Um, uh, I think um, leading the task group comes uh, with uh, responsibility on a different level and um, uh, with the constant need to actively engage with everything that's going on um, in the task group uh, with the different issues and arguments. So um, I imagine that um, this was no easy task, as you said. Um, it's uh, it it was like the eighteen month or so um, in, in the making, and uh, uh, I myself I find it difficult like to again and again um, get into um, the vibe and uh, get into um, the thinking of uh, what the task group uh, of the things that the task group is meant to achieve. If this is something that you do not do on a constantly every day in your work, so. Um, so thanks a lot for um, for bringing us all together again and again and driving the cause of the task group forward. Um, uh, I, I thought this you did really an amazing job. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was it was great to work with everybody. Um, I really enjoyed um, the arguments and the uh, resolutions. It was all good. So. All right, well, does anybody have anything else or can we take off early? Sounds like we can take off early. Yeah, <laughs> hit the beach. And, I'm, I'm kind of far from the beach. <laughs> Stan, I'm the, I think I'm the host, so I'm just gonna stop recording and then um,